Welcome to the Present Fathers Podcast. This is the show that focuses on climbing the mountain of fatherhood together. We believe that dads matter. That's why this show is for you. So gear up, dads. Get ready. It's time to start climbing. Welcome to another episode of the Present Fathers Podcast. Our guest today is Nick Kumalatsos. Nick is a husband, father, author, Marine Raider, a recon Marine, founder of the Agogi, host of the Always Forward podcast, and a serial business builder. Nick, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, guys. Yeah, yeah we are super excited to uh, hear your story, share it with our listeners, and uh, hopefully learn from your experience. So with that said, um, could you start out with kind of highlighting your Marine service, your, your uh, 12 years in uh, special operations, and also if you could maybe hone in a little bit on what it takes to become a recon Marine as well as a Marine Raider. Cause I think most of our listeners probably don't have much of an idea of that. Yeah. I would say you said a lot of nice things. I'd say maybe learn from a lot of failures. That's <laughs> probably, probably more, more along the lines of what's true. Um, yeah. So grew up, yeah, grew up with my mom, my little brother, um, kind of traveling all the United States, um, kind of like a gypsy caravan situation. And uh, and then finally wanted some stability and then found that and then panicked in that stability and said, you know what, I'm going to blow my whole life up. And, uh, and at the time I was 16 years old, making about $4,000 cash a week legally. Yeah. Legally. Wow. Yeah. Um, where that money went, I have absolutely no idea, um, at all whatsoever, but, uh, life was pretty good for a little while. Nonetheless, um, Ended up wanting to join the Marine Corps, and so I I went to the recruiter and said, "Hey, I'm going to join the Marine Corps," and they're like, "Yeah, sure." And they you know they try to sell you know the deal, the recruiter spiel. They try to sell you. I'm like, "Listen, man, I'm already sold. Let's just let's just do this thing." Right. So they ran my information, went to the back, came back out, and they're like, "You're never joining the Marine Corps or any branch. You're a convicted felon, two time convicted felon, and a host of other issues." And, uh, so of course that was the driving factor in my life to become a Marine. Cause they told me no. And my rebellious spirit kicked in. I was like, well, I'll show you. And, and I did, but it took almost two years. And, uh, so I ended, ended up, I finally got, finally joined and, um, and then, yeah, I spent 12 years in the Marine Corps from 2000 to 2012. Uh, I call that the fun years. We were very busy <laughs> from 2000. We're well, from 2001 to 2012. We were very busy uh, and just kind of leveled up through the Marine Corps. Nothing was ever good enough for me. And, uh, you know, I got a job and then that job wasn't the Marine Corps that I thought. So I got an opportunity to uh, to go try out for a recon, uh, force recon. And I took selection and passed. Ended up on uh, the cover. My selection actually I ended up on the cover of Marine Corps Times, which did not serve me very well at the time. Um, I got some extra, extra. Yeah, I was just say your instructor's probably like, oh, you're the famous yeah. guy. Here you go. And I immediately That's pointed to my buddy and said, no, that wasn't me. That was him. <laughs> he looked similar. Dan knew. I was like, no, that was all him. Um, so we both kind of got it. But nonetheless, after the fact, that you know, now it's hung up in my office, so. It's funny how those things shift, you know, perception shifts the way where you see things. Um, I hated it originally anyways, cause I was coming up out of the pool and I'm all like, uh, you know, there's like strained face and I'm all, you know, soaking wet and p in pain. Um, but it was, it's a, it's a good, it's a good shot to capture in time. Anyways, took, took, took selection for force recon, got selected, stayed there for a little while. And then, uh, and then in 2006, the second, uh, Second Force Recon Company, Reconnaissance Company, turned into Second Marine Raider Battalion. Um, took selection for that, and I didn't need to necessarily, but it was this weird time, so like I had to go back through selection again. Um, a lot of my friends didn't, but uh, just because of timing, because I went out to Third Recon, came back. By the time I came back, they're like, "Oh, you got to take selection again," and I was like, "How many times do I need to take selection?" Jesus, guys. But I was very glad that I did. And in the last half of my career, I spent at Marine Special Operations deploying in Afghanistan um, and, you know, serving SOCOM and their mission over there. And uh, it was rad, I got to say, you know, not many people get to say they ride motorcycles out of the back of, back of helicopters and with, you know, guns and all their friends and, you know, a 314 man 
uh, motorcycle gang, local motorcycle gang in Afghanistan, which I got to do. So it's pretty wild. Uh, that's, that's yeah, checking the box for me, right? On yeah. That one. yeah. It's like a, it sounds like a Fast and the Furious plot line. Yeah, it's like, it's like a cross between that and, <laughs> uh, and you know, 1980s Delta Force, you know, which yeah. ignores, you know. I didn't have rocket. I had rocket, but it's not attached to the bike. Yeah. Oh, I love it. He's riding Raptors around too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so let's fast forward a little bit. Um, you know, what, what made you decide to leave the Marine Corps? Was it just burnout from all the deployments or was it a lot of yeah. things? It was honestly, it was, um, and you kind of, how long did you do? I did about five active, um, right. in the reserve. Well, then you know, now, so but, you did, yeah. yeah, you did five active. You ever remember seeing those like senior guys that are just like really bitter and grumpy and look like they're drinking yeah. all the time. Yeah, yeah, I was turning into that guy mm. and I recognized it. And uh, so there's a couple different things. One was I was to be to do the, the reality is this. You have to be a certain personality to do that kind of job. And if you do that job long enough, you can get real jaded and dark. You know what I mean? And you could be really comfortable living in this morally gray area. Um, so that was one thing that was happening. And because of that, it was making me bitter and dark. And, you know, it's just. It's just the way that it is. And um, and then the other thing was the last deployment, when it was time to leave, my last deployment, I wasn't ready. Like usually if you if you know, it's like being it's just imagine being a football player and you only do practice. Right. You don't want to only do practice. You want to play the game like you practice to play to play on the field. Well, that's the way it was for us. Like we practiced all year and then, you know, like once a year, I mean, out of 12 years, I was gone for six years. All right. I want to play the game. So when it came to go to deployment, everybody's like aching to go overseas and do the, and, and play the game. Right. Yeah. That last deployment as even as awesome as it was, and I'm so glad it was my last one, uh, the way that, that we went out on that one, um, I wasn't ready to go. I wasn't ready to get on that plane and fly overseas. I was like, oh, man, I could just do a little bit more time with my kids, a little more time with my family. And that was to me was a was a, a sure sign that it was like, OK, it's time to wrap this up. It's time to hang this up, you know, and plus politically, yeah. you know, I, I don't want to get into much of that. But there was a lot of political stuff happening around that time um, yeah. with Bush leaving and then Obama coming in and then. You know, operating at the level of special operations, the State Department's involved, the agencies involved. So you just get a lot of bureaucratic stuff. And right. you know, so they would come to us and ask questions. And we're like, why Why are we? What, what, what are we doing? Yeah. If you're asking this, what do, why, are, why are you sending us here? You know? Exactly. So, yeah. It was well, time I appreciate for you. To do something else. <laughs> yeah. Well, so I, I like... Uh, how for you it was tied a lot to you know your kids and, and being a father because yeah. uh, for me that was that was you know i had my first child and then i was like Oof, i don't know if i'm going to do this for 20 years right so yeah. um definitely a wake-up call um so can you tell us now a little bit about you leave the marine corps did you have a plan you know what what did that look like and then you know i'm just kind of watching your content i've kind of seen that you know you you would kind of let yourself go a little bit and you know so what yeah how how did that go initially and then what kind of made you make the change to to get to where you are now Oh man, you know, you think you have it all figured out. And I thought I, I thought I 100% thought it had a, I had thought I had a plan. Um, and I just, I was very, here's the, here's the, uh, the good. I was very confident in my abilities, maybe overly confident. Um, but nonetheless, I, I thought I had a plan. Uh, I got out, I went on terminal like towards the end of the summer. I had like, you know, in, in, in that world, you have so, I mean, you lose leave days constantly. You know, I had like 120 leave days. I think I lost, you know, 30. So I was down to like 90. So I think I took like 90. I think I took a little bit of leave and then came back and then took terminal for 90 days. And man, I got a job, which I, it was the job that I had always, that I was hunting for anyway. But because during that time from the end of summer, physical year, October, contracting and everything is just really it's a weird weird time they don't know if they're going to get a contract they don't know if they're going to get renewed so they're not hiring people so it's just a really awkward time to get a job nonetheless right at the end right at the end like a couple days before my eas i got a job contracting um and 
but during terminal is when really like I started to ha- kind of have this some weird, I don't know, mental issues, like identity issues. Like, what am I doing with my life? Like, you know, and anyways, so I got a job and that, that was a distraction and I contracted for about a year and a half. Um, but that over that whole entire time over that, you know, year and a half. Um, and even after that, man, I was, uh, not doing well at all. And it really just comes down to this. I mean, one, of course, a ton of trauma over the past 12 years, right? A a ton of stuff that you witness that because you're staying so consistently moving forward in operation, like you're not really dealing with anything. Like somebody dies, somebody gets hurt. Like it's, it's a tragedy, but the reality is, I mean, you're just, the op continues and then you get back and the deployment continues and then you go back home and then training continues and then you're just the next deployment. So you really never stop moving until you, you get out and then everything stops and then you got to deal with your shit. And the best way I can explain it to someone listening is imagine your kid or yourself, and this has happened to a lot of adults. Uh, and I wrote about this in my book, The Excommunicated Warrior. And this is why this story really resonates with any person. Because it's a human. I thought I was thought I was like, oh, veterans. It's a veteran problem. Not a veteran problem. It's a human being problem. If you take a kid and he's in peewee football at five years old, and then he's playing for middle school, and then he's playing for high school, and then he goes to college, and then he gets drafted, or he plays minor or pro league, whatever, the NFL, it doesn't matter. He's a professional football player. This kid, as long as he has memories in his brain, all he knows is football. Then at 23 years old, he gets sideswiped, blows his knee out, and is never able to play football again at 23 years old. What do you think is going to happen to that young man? He's totally devastated. Dark places. Doesn't know who he is. Doesn't know who he is. Doesn't know. like All I know is football. If I can't do football, what can I? I don't know anything else. Probably didn't even get good grades in school. You know what yeah. I mean? Probably just Doesn't did his work enough, right? Yeah. Tom Brady had 10 years to prepare and he still hasn't handled it well, right? It was tough right. for him too. Yeah. Like it, it's, it's who you are as a human being. So like if I look at me from the time I was 19 years old until, the, until, I, was, until I was 30, 31, I'm a Raider. I'm the, I'm the stuff on the back of my wall is what identifies me as that's what I, it's who I am. It's the clothes that I wear. It's the way I speak. It's my friends who I hang out. It's the neighborhood I live in. It's where my kids go to school. It's who I like, who I go on vacation with. It's, it's everything about me. And then you get out and not only are you not that thing anymore, but the phone stops ringing. Your friends stop coming around. They stop checking up on you. Right. And then all this shit. 300 miles, you know, you got a train going 300 miles an hour behind you of baggage that you've collected over a period of time. And then you're going down to 10 miles an hour and all that stuff just hits you right in the back of the head. And you got to deal with it all at once. It's a lot. It's a lot. And so that's what happens to people's lives. And it can be anything from, and you know, my story, I'm not a special butterfly. And that's what I've realized. We're not especially these men, man, you're not a, your, your story is not unique to you. You're not a special butterfly. Like (laughs) you're just not, you're not. And I can prove it time and time again. Like the, the the reason why we think we're special and my story is so unique is because men don't talk to each other. Yep. We've said that a lot. That isolation is isolation is a huge problem but as soon as you open up right and you start caring you telling these stories about how you're feeling and things you're struggling you're like yeah dude so am i right it's a, it's like, a different a different arena but it's the same it's the same know. thing yeah it's the same yeah. story you switch out i got i worked that i i talked i mean you you can imagine the amount of people I've, I've spoken to about this but it's everything from a mom who has empty nest syndrome she's like put herself on the back burner raise their kids and what happens who has kids over 20 i've i've a 21 year old who has a kid over 20 or over 18 let me tell you what happens when they turn 18 
to mom and dad. Deuces. You're like, what do I? They're done, bro. They're gone. Not they don't love you, but they're just going to, they're like excited to go live their own life. Yep. Start their own adventure. Yeah. Start their own adventure. And rightfully so. But if, yeah, think about the mother who's put their whole entire life on pause, their whole entire life on back burner for these kids. And it's like, boom. Right. Now, who am I? Or the guy who worked for UPS and he thought he was going to, he's a union guy, he thought he was going to work, you know, work until 30 years and get his retirement. What happens? Oh, you're a corporate, you work for, you're a corporate guy. 28 years, deuces, you're done. You're like, let go. Yep. See ya. Happens all the time. So we attach our, we attach our identity to the thing that we do. And when that thing ends, whew, it's a hard thing to deal with. And then you're like all messed up and you're like, I can't relate. And then you start thinking like, my wife sucks. My kids suck. No, dude, you suck. <laughs> that too sucks, man. That too sucks. And I thought the same exact thing, man. I was like, yeah. oh, I can't. My kids suck. My wife sucks. And it was really just me. I sucked. Yeah. Right. So what was that wake up call for you then to kind of start making, making a, a difference, kind of changing trajectory? Oh man, there's a lot of things that happened. I can't say it was a very big one. There was a big one that's, you know, there was a, there was a death that really woke me up. I, I would say that I was already on the road of personal development and things like that. Um, slowly. I, I had a, has anybody read my book by any chance? Not yet. I ordered it. So it's in the mail. Okay. Uh, as well. So yeah, but I won't give it away too much. There's, there's a, there's a, not a scenario. There's an incident in that book um that was real pivotal for me and uh it was kind of one of those like sink or swim situations you know what i mean and uh that moment by no means did i like come out of it and go oh i'm better or like i know what to do no i was extremely just as jacked up as i was before the situation but i had made the decision that okay i got to do something but after that i just got drunk essentially um, that was how I coped with it that night and just got more drunk. Um, so anyways, um, but that kind of led to the journey of, of personal development and growth. And, and it was very slow because you just, you just don't know what you don't know. Um, luckily for me, I got, you know, the universe lined up and, and, uh, as I was going down this journey, I linked up with, it was almost like the people appeared to me in my life when I needed them. You know what I mean? Like as I'm going down this yeah. road, these guys, like guys like Carl Munger is the one of the first ones that showed up. He was a executive. He's the executive director of uh, an organization called Gallant Few. So he showed up. I started working with him and he really, and then it was a guy like Kirk Weisler. And then through all these guys, then I went to a brain clinic. You know what I mean? So like, it was the work because like, what happens is individuals find themselves thinking that things are going to just change because I want them to. <laughs> like, it's no. been, like, 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 the, the loose definition of insanity, right? Expecting things right. to change without not actually banging your head against that wall. Yeah. yeah. So you're like, so I talk to guys, what are you doing while well, I'm, I'm sitting on the couch? You're, and you're just just sitting there, huh? You think something you're going to get more fit. Your life's going to get better by just sitting there. No. And I'm very aggressive and I'm being very PC and nice on this podcast. I'm very aggressive with people now. Very. Because men don't need to be. What's the word? Coddled. 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 Yeah. yeah. Like we, we just don't, we don't yep. respond. And, and I, when I first started working with people, I kind of did coddle them like, Oh, you know, empathy is important. It's blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, now I'm just like, ah, screw all that. Like I have empathy. My empathy is I want men to succeed. I want you to have right. a great relationship with your wife. I want you to be a badass dad. I want you to be, you know, like I want you to be successful in life. That's my empathy. I want you to win. Yeah. And if I have to kick your ass to get you to win, so be it. <laughs> but I love exactly. you. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's kind of like, you know, with parenting too, but if you're coaching, right, you have to, or leading others, you, you have to, you know, you, you have the vision, you have the clear end point you want to get yeah. them to, and they can't see it. 
And so right. they're going to kick and scream and complain the whole time. But when you'll finally drag them up to the top of that hill and they'll be like, I made it to the hill. Yeah, and I don't then, drag. And then they'll anybody. go, oh, thanks. You know, but I won't drag anybody. I'll just keep boot, you know, boot to ass down yeah. the road. You know, but, until they, kick. Yeah, until they <laughs> build up. Yes, grenades behind them. Yeah, until they build their own momentum up. Um, but nonetheless, nonetheless, that's what happened. And, and the reason why I bring that up is because this. You're not going to find somebody. I was just on a call uh, or on a podcast the other day and talking about, well, how did you find these mentors? I didn't find them. They presented themselves to me when I was walking the path, when I was doing the work. I was searching information. I was networking. I was trying to get better. I was trying to get smarter on who I was and how do I work in this world and how do I become, uh, you know, like you go in the military, you're constantly training to do that job, right? You're constantly developing yourself to be a better operator, to learn, you know, intelligence, learn operations, learn how to build things and execute things and whatever, whatever that is. But we get out and we think it's kind of like college, right? You get out and you think, well, education is done. I can stop learning now. I've learned it all at 21 years old. <laughs> and, then, and then you just get more dumb as, as time goes on. And then life comes and hits you with a bat and it's like, surprise. Surprise. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you're an idiot. <laughs> but that, that's really what I try to explain. Like you're, nothing is going to change until you do. Once you start changing, well, then the universe kind of lines up. God, who whatever it is to you, is going to line up those people. They're going to put those people in your path for you to learn. But you have to walk the freaking path to bump into them. If you I want like to be that, a man. good dad, go go follow good dads. Yep. Go That's get it, a man. coach. Go get a mentor. And people knock it. They're like, well, if you need to be, you need a coach to be a good man. Well, you're not. Failure the best athlete class. in the world have a coach to teach the, you know what I mean? So it's why, you why would you get you, to the Olympics by yourself, asshole? Right. Yeah. Why would you the best? Not, <laughs> why would you not do that with, you know, fatherhood and being a man? Because those are your first callings, right? Right. Your job is secondary. Yeah. So, and the best teacher of all is failure, man. 100%. Yeah. So, so, anyways, that's, that's how I found those individuals. And through that, and then, and then of course, somebody did die. And that really kind of like, I said, okay. I'm, I'm done. How do I word this? I'm done doing this half-ass, if that makes sense. I'm, I'm yeah. done doing this on an amateur level. Right. You're all in. Like, now I'm all in. Not am I all in with myself. I'm all in with my family. And I, I, I was, yeah, I, I, I knew I wanted to be with my girlfriend for like the rest of my life. But I didn't want to get married because I had this ha hang up about marriage. And I just said, I just said, you know what? Screw it. We're getting married. So I asked her to marry me. And her response goes, are you sure? <laughs> that was her response. You're an ultra romantic. I can see. <laughs> yes. I love it. And uh, I am. Yeah, right. Not even close. But I tried. I tried. I had this huge gesture and everything. And she goes, she was totally thrown off. She's like, you sure? Anyways, we got married. and. Um, and then it was, you know, I was done having kids because I had two older kids. Next thing I know, I've got a little, I've got my first son um, and we're looking, we're working on another. So like, you, you know, you just open, you go down this road and you go from amateur level to professional level when it, in this environment, right? And oh my God, it opens your whole world to opportunity and love and more money. I mean, it just absolutely has blown my mind what my life has turned into when I stopped playing at the amateur level in my life. Yeah. And I, I feel like that is where you go from being interested in something to committed. Yeah. You know, you've counted the cost and that's when you really start putting the actual effort consistently through. So. Yeah. It's, it's like, you know, and I tell guys all the time, I'm like, listen, guys, just go all in on your life, man. Go all in. Put, just put all the chips in and go all in on everything. If, if it revolves around your life and your family, sit down with your significant other and go, hey, I want to go all in on this. No more half-assing stuff. I like that. You got to burn the ships. 
That's right. Yeah, exactly. Nick, have you ever been able to reach somebody that didn't think they needed help? It sounds like you knew, all right, something's not right. I need some help. What do you do for guys who don't think they need help? They think everything's fine, even though it's not. I'm brutally honest with them and I don't help them. Wow. I can dig it. I mean, you got to, if they're not willing to help themselves, I'm out, you know, bro. I'm not you, can them, you can lead them to water, but they won't drink, right? This is, and this is why I get like, go, go, go look at some YouTube comments or Facebook comments on some of my videos. Like, it's hilarious. <laughs> can I, I screenshot them and post them just because I like it? Um, but because it just shows the weakness of the, the weakness of men. Like, anytime you start commenting negative, I'm like, oh, you're a weak man. You have insecurities. Yeah. A healthy, so, positive male never says, never like goes, takes time to go comment something negative. Exactly. Yeah, they're yeah. out. They're out conquering their life. You know. Yeah, I don't have time. So what? So what they will do is, man. I'm, this is this is what they will do, regardless of what it is. They'll go, man. I'm so happy for you. Congratulations. Good for you. Because healthy, strong men want other people to win. I want. I want men to win. I want my friends to win. Yeah, love that man. So I was going to ask, according to Nick, what's a strong man then in, in our culture today? What's a strong father? I'll say I'll I'll say this. If you, if you look at if you look at uh, we can get into the granular things, but I'll, I'll we'll we'll hit the high the high points. And this is really just the most success, like the most successful people in the world. Like and I've said I've like met billionaires that have come down and, and this and they and they execute these traits. One, they're extremely grateful. I mean, extremely grateful. They wake up with gratitude. Like, do you wake up every morning going, dang, hell yeah, another day? Yeah. Or do you wake up and go, oh, my back hurts. (laughs) My knee hurts. Must be the pressure must have dropped. My knee hurts. Do you wake up every day? Grateful for your life, grateful that even even if there's shit going on in your life, there's something. Do you wake up grateful to breathe? I heard something saying, Hey, if I gave if if I would give you a million dollars, would you take it? Everybody's like, Well, yeah, I'd take a million dollars. But you couldn't wake up tomorrow morning. You won't wake up tomorrow morning if I give you a million dollars. Well, no, I wouldn't take it. What about $10 million? I wouldn't take it. So that tell you're telling me that waking up tomorrow morning is worth more than $10 million. I figure like you have something to be grateful about. Puts things in perspective, doesn't it? It really does. does. Wow. The second thing is this. They're extremely giving. Giving of their time, energy, money, whatever that is to you. It doesn't have to be money, but they're giving. They're giving of their information, their wisdom. They're giving of whatever they can give. Whatever it is that you can give, that you can offer the world, they will give it. Now, this is not necessarily like, you know, like I'm talking, I'm not talking about the whole business thing where like anything worth doing is not, you know, worth doing for money. Like you charge people. That's, that's, that is, but there's still a way to give in this world, right? There's still a way to give of yourself. Yeah. Pay it forward. Yeah. That's all it is. Yep. And a lot of times it's wisdom. Sometimes it's money. You know, and I think you should do that. So they're extremely giving. Third thing is they're extremely vulnerable. They're very, very open about all of their past struggles or or where they're at in life. All of their failures. There's nothing to hide. There's no, there's nothing in the shadows. They had an affair and they got a divorce. They talk about it and why they, why it happened. They have a failed business. They talk about it. Why? It goes back to being giving. They're vulnerable about their own mistakes so they can give to you so that you can learn. So you might not make the same ones. Right? And the fourth thing is, the fourth thing is they are addicted to personal growth. Addicted to personal growth. Now you take those four things and you can start getting into like the granularity of, of what that means. Right. Then I can start, I can start breaking into their physical fitness. Like you, you can narrow these things down 
into everything because now you like, okay, if I really start breaking all of these things down, well, ha they have to be disciplined, right? They have to be disciplined. They have to be fit. They have to have self-belief. They have to know their why, right? So these things kind of broke down into other different ethics and morals and values. Can that person with those top four things, can that person be like super overweight? Not if you're addicted to personal growth, right? Hmm. So anyways, yeah, those, that's that, good. that would be the four. And if you can take those four and you start with those and you self-analyze, you go do my, my business partner with the Gogi, our coaching group, he has this whole talk that he kind of does on, you know, like talk, having a conversation with the man in the mirror calls a mirror check and legit, this is sound weird. And I'm, I'm taking this from Josh. Go talk to yourself in the mirror and tell yourself things and try to lie to yourself. Like verbally go look yourself in the eyes and go tell yourself and then go through those four things and then basically do a checklist. Am I meeting the mark on all these different things? Because you can't lie to yourself. You might try. You'll look yourself right in there and know you're full of shit. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Harsh. Super awkward to do. But it's like, it's a punch in the gut and you'll know exactly, exactly the areas that you need to prove on. I like that. That's very That's practical. Problem. Everyone can go do that after listening to that. So I like that. Um, Might take a couple times. <laughs> yeah. It'll take some time <laughs> to work it out. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm really glad you've highlighted that though of, of uh, you know, you have to take that moment and account for yourself. Right. And we live in today's day and age it's like you know it's always someone else's fault but the only way to grow is to say no it's not someone else's fault where do i need to start and start like you said you you found all that help because you were looking for it yourself first i was walking kind of got it yeah. along the way yeah yeah so um i want to transition a little bit more now to nick the father um and at the end we'll we'll recap a we'll, talk about all the different things you're running between the agogi and all the different businesses and stuff. But um, I'll start it off with the fatherhood questions of, you know, what's your favorite thing ab about being a dad? Oh, man, it's the, it's the best and worst thing. It's, it's the best and also the worst thing. And you guys probably know where it is, is watching them grow up. Watching them change. Absolutely. And I get to do it all over again now. Cause I hit the reset button, which everybody was like, you're crazy, man. You were almost out. <laughs> And it really is the best and what the best and the worst thing is just literally just watching them change. And what, like right now he's on this, his brain is on fire. The little one, his brain is absolutely on fire. He's just soaking up everything. And he's, the milk, he's, he's like, man, I have a lot of energy. He's not even three yet. He's like running around the house. He's like, I think I need some caffeine. I'm like you don't ever need caffeine. Yeah. <laughs> negative ghost rider that pattern is full <laughs> he'd jump over the moon yeah. if he had some <laughs> yeah you don't need caffeine man i need to drink whatever you're whatever you got anyways but that's that's the best and the worst thing man is just watching that whole story and you know involve and and then being being able to be a part in that that's awesome yeah so you are a badass marine still are um you're an entrepreneur what about your mindset is unique about the way that you're a parent. For example, someone who didn't have that background, how would they treat their kids uh, versus how you do it? So first, I am naturally a rebellious person. Anybody who's been following me since 2020, if you might scroll back <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> yeah. uh, yep. <laughs> we'll leave that alone. But, um, I'm naturally a rebellious person, so the status quo of things um, doesn't sit well with me. If the herd's going in one direction, mm, I have cause for concern, and I typically go the, the opposite direction. So when it comes to my kids, I want them to be prepared for life. What does that mean? That means the education system's not doing it for them. Anybody work on um, dissecting frogs or photosynthesis in the last? Oh yeah, 
I remember those. Oh, oh yeah. Yep. Yeah. Like that really part of your life. You know. Well, yeah. kind of for Dustin and I. Yeah, we, we, yeah. <laughs> but not I so much. Like you, you yeah. know, and... <laughs> just a tiny bit. Yeah. Tiny, bit. tiny ones. It's it's not something that our kids need to know, right? Do they know how? To, do they know anything about credit? They know anything about interest rates. They know how to start a business. They know what a P and L is. Change a tire. I mean, do they know? Do they know how to defend themselves? Know how to clean a rifle? And how to grow food? They know how to communicate. They know the twelve the twelve things of leadership. Right. They don't. Like that. They don't. They know they do they know classic stories. They really know history, true history. Not the stuff that they have to memorize for school. Do they know it? Do they know the rise and fall of civilizations and why and why civilizations fall? Can they see patterns? This is not stuff that's more that's that's so complicated that children can't understand. I think a lot of people are waking up to that too, because just in my own life, I, I know a lot more people homeschooling now than ever before in my life. Uh, but even with homeschool, you can't take a shit product, bring it home, and and expect something right. different. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yep. Like you have to completely change the paradigm. Yeah. The whole thing. The whole thing. My three year old's talking about starting. Uh, he's not even three. He's talking about his first business. He's got like two different business ideas. You know what I'm saying? There's such a power in the way that you explain things to your kids, the way you raise things to your kids. We have conversations about protein. Mitri, what do you want for dinner? Protein. Why? Because protein makes muscles. He wants to beat you one day. <laughs> he is going to beat me one day. He is going to beat me. And that would be a beautiful day for me. But absolutely. Little things like that. Like, I, you know, we talk about, we talk about treasuring his mom and treasuring women and protecting them. So he tries to fight his mom. He's like, no, you don't fight your mom. You're sweet to your mom. You fight me. So I'm in here. This is my home office. And he'll walk through that door and he'll be like, dad, I want to fight. I'm like, okay. Guess we're going to the playroom to fight. So I, I wouldn't say that it's, it's, to me, it's not strange. To me, it's not different. But what's happening outside of that is what we're what we're doing is we're not parenting that way. We're not leading our children. We're expecting our children to be led by someone else. And then we're managing our children. We're not we're not leading or teaching our children. We're managing them. We're managing their time. We're managing their education. We're managing their emotions. We're not leading and teaching them. My, my wife is a second grade school teacher, and I can tell you the curriculum has nothing about critical thinking, logic, finance. None of that stuff is going to be in their future. And so that's why me and my wife have weekly meetings with our children. We call them, you know, just family gatherings or whatever. And I we should. discuss things with our children like this is what you need to learn. And we give them expectations and we make them learn it. And, you know, uh, it, it's it's such an important and critical thing. But. You know, speaking on lessons, my question for you is, um, you know, I'm sure the Marines and everything else in your life, like entrepreneurship, have taught you specific lessons. But what's the most important thing fatherhood has taught you and how have you grown from it? So uh, going back to the schooling stuff real quick, I did a podcast with a guy named Matt Bardu. I don't know if you've ever seen him. He needs, he should you should reach out to him on have him on if he hasn't already been on. Um he, we just did a podcast completely, almost a three hour podcast on the education system, all the way going back to the 1800s, how it all started, why it started, how it came to the US and why it is, why our education system is the way that it is. If you're a parent, you have kids, you need to listen to that podcast. It should be my number one podcast. Um, there is somebody said it, the Prussian system. Yep. Um, yep. Yeah. Look into that. Uh, anyways, it won't be my number one podcast because unfortunately people won't break their yeah, pe people habit. want the quick flashy thing. They don't want to listen to what's actually going to help them, but I'll make sure that we put that in the description of this one. So that everyone has a link to that. I Brandon, to answer your question, I don't think the Marine Corps really, I think the Marine Corps didn't really teach me anything like that. 
I don't think it gave me anything. Um, I don't, I wouldn't want to give them any credit. I would say my relentless dedication to personal growth is what did it. Yes. Did I learn about operations on operational planning, phase line approach to training, phase line approach to like accomplishing an objective, et cetera, et cetera. Yes. I learned that in the, I learned that in the Marine Corps. And then I took it and I refined it and made it me a better entrepreneur and a better leader outside of that. The reality is the military leadership is garbage. Ooh. Nobody wants to say that. Sorry, YouTube, don't censor us. <laughs> <laughs> it's true that they, yeah. they lead by they lead by rank and follow because of that. Now there are certain leaders in the in the military that people and, and I'm sure George knows, like there's guys that like I followed because I had to, but then there was guys that I followed because, man, I would follow that guy literally into the gates of hell because he's a good leader and he, and I, and it's, just, it's a different feeling. And those right. guys get out and the, and the other ones stay. Yep. That's right. So. That's right. Um, so it really had nothing to do with that. It's the people that are addicted to personal growth that understand how to communicate. They're a level nine, 10 communicator. And they're just absolutely addicted to knowledge and addicted to the process, not the end result. You can't be addicted to an end result. The end result is what it is. You're addicted to the process and the journey of what it's ha what's happening. That's what made has made me a better father. And I'll be honest, I completely screwed it up through the first two. Completely. And I apologize to them all the time. Like, and they see it. They're like, Jeez, dad, this is, this is the way you are now. <laughs> I'm like, ah, I'm sorry. You know, you guys got, you guys both got cars and insurance you don't pay for. <laughs> you know, my kids first five years of therapy is on me. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> Whatever you guys need is on me. Yeah. And that's, that's a really unique, uh, answer to that type of question that we've heard. So I, I love that. That's, yeah, uh, I like that a lot. Just letting that soak in from it and being a sponge so, right sorry, now. Sorry if it wasn't like super cookie cutter. No, we don't. I mean, that's that's why we do this, right? We're trying to we're trying to get to the the real the meat of what yeah. you guys aren't getting today. Uh, and it's such a mess, right? There's just like where do you even go to get started? Right? If you're if you're a, a new dad and you're like, man, I don't even know what to do, but I want to do it better. Like there's a million women's groups, but there's only a few things for men. You know, it's hard to go you for it. Are, it. You are exactly who you hang out with. That that saying was the same when you were a kid as a teenager that it is as a father. If you're standing in your backyard in the neighborhood with a Bud Light, or maybe we're not drinking Bud Light anymore. I don't know what the rules are for that. Um, <laughs> but, Whiskey, you can't go wrong. Did I just get you guys so. canceled? I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. no, no, no. I, I'm a rebel like you. YouTube, we're not sorry. So actually, three of us are doing 75 hard right now. So it's water. You know, it's liquid Good. death for now. But Good. Um, but the point is, is like if you're the the guy with the beer gut sitting around a bunch of other dads in lawn chairs with a beer gut all drinking beer, what do you think you're going to like? What conversations are you having? Pretty boring right. ones. <laughs> like, How about that game? Like I don't, I, I don't give a shit about sports. I don't, I just don't care. Like, and you can judge me for however you want to judge me. Again, don't care because my life is awesome. And if your life is not more awesome than mine, or if your life doesn't look like the way that I want mine, then I would never take your advice. But we are who we hang out with. So what are the conversations that you're having with other men? Are they talking about people? Because you know the saying. Small minds talk about people. Average minds talk about ideas. Great or uh, events. Great minds talk about ideas. So what are you talking about? Are we sitting around talking about like this conversation, how to be a better dad, how to be a better husband, how to be better men, how to get more fit, how to make more money, how to make it a generational impact on our families? Now, if you're having those conversations, I want in. If you're not, I'm not interested. I'm I'm just a fan already. Yeah. Um, so I honestly wanted to. Justin, I'm real brutal about that too. As soon as I hear it, here's if you find. Can I give you a quick tool? If you find yourself with a group of people and they're talking about people, 
Okay. Here's that. Here's the, here's the tool of how you switch up the whole conversation. First of all, you start talking about the, asking about themselves. So you go from other people to themselves. People love talking about themselves. So you just ask questions about themselves, right? Like what's going on with you? What are you into? Which, you know, blah, 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 goals, et cetera, whatever they're going to bite. You just take it off of there. Then you pivot from themselves. You take what they're saying and you talk about events. So you start, you create the level up game. You take what they're talking about and then you tie it to an event. Once you start talking about these, these events that are happening, then you switch into ideas. How can we improve on those things? Next thing you know, your whole conversation is talking about ideas and you're like, yeah, good. Here we go. Now, now I can be in this conversation. Let's see. I have to use that for sure. Um, so yeah, I guess my question is a little uh, off the subject, but uh, I guess with the adventures you've been on, what's the craziest story you can give us that you're allowed to share? Let me put it that way. <laughs> Crazy. There's so I don't know. There's so. There's so. What are your favorites? Doesn't matter. I I know you got some good ones, man. <laughs> okay, here's a funny one at my own expense. <laughs> um 2015 i got selected to be you guys it's I, I think you can find it it's free on somewhere uh i got i got selected to be a a a guide on this scripted reality show called trails Blade, trailblazers anybody come across that when they google me thank god <laughs> yeah um so I, I was this special operations guy that was going to lead this this uh, elite team of scientists into the into the uh, in the jungles of Bolivia to find this like ancient crocodile that's like been so removed from civilization that it's basically like the direct link to like prehistoric age dinosaurs. And if they could get the blood from this crocodile, this black caiman, then they'd be able to like create all these vaccines and save the world from you know destruction it's kind of that dramatic and then they they wrote stuff on me that was like nick kumlazos black ops special operations raiders just ridiculous you know they gotta boast it anyway so i'm down there we're doing the whole thing i think it was like episode three maybe two um i had one guy that was about to like and you can hype out in the jungle and he just they weren't that fit well, he, I saved a guy from basically drowning real time, which they removed because it was too realistic. They had to do this whole like ra like boat scene where they get dumped into this river and it was like real rapids. And then like he couldn't swim that well. And I ended up having to save him like legitimately. And it was kind of a nightmare. And then <laughs> he walked off camera and he was pissed. He almost quit. And anyways, that all happened, which they got cut, which that was like my real hero moment reality um, tv yeah reality TV. anyways we go to this other place he's hyping out because of the temperature changes at night right like you could be at like 120 degrees and it drops to 80 but then you're wet and it's a you know a 40 degree change I mean, you know like like literally you can hype out at 80 degrees it's wild just because of it's a, a extreme drop in body temp so i'm making a fire it's raining in the jungle, my knife slips off this thing and slices into my thumb, into the top of my thumb here, severed three tendons and a nerve in the jungle. Yeah. For like, I don't know, millions of people to watch on Discovery. Ouch. The guide, the special operations yeah. guy. Yeah. Murphy. And if Murphy's law got you. Oh man, it was, it was, you know, it's whatever, you know, shit happens, but, uh, it was just funny. And then, and of course I still promoted the show and everything. I don't really care. It happens, but, um, nonetheless, it was just funny. The guy, the badass guy. And I literally said to someone, I said, he was swinging a hatchet and I said, please be careful where you're swinging that thing. I don't want you to cut yourself out here. <laughs> And then I put the knife on this log and it was wet and it slipped and it slid right. But they did, they put a hacking sound like I was hacking this wood in the editing and it was like my back so that you couldn't see. So it, lo it, sa it looked and sounded like I was hacking something and then I just like hacked my own hand. That's not the way it happened at all, but it's very dramatic. And then they show it, they show the tendon going in and out, the, the clip of it going in and out. And uh, uh, the comments were hilarious on that one. but. Nonetheless, yeah, it looks like you've recovered a little bit, though. 
Yeah, it's whatever. It's fine. <laughs> I was going to say, I bet they had to bleep out a few words you were saying or that inner dialogue. Hit it so I, 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 I kind of was like, oh, I was like, oh, crap. I'm, I'm like processing in my head. Right. And then, um, nonetheless, I, um, I asked the producer, I said, listen, man, let's just like, we don't have that many, like that long. Like, I can go a pretty good amount of time. Like, let's just wrap this thing up, splint it. And then I'll finish the show, which in reality, I, I, I would have done, like it was a real mission I would have done. And he was just like looking at me with big eyes and like, I don't think we can do that. So they medevaced me out of there. It was a 13 hour medevac to get out of the jungle. I had to take, I had to hike out of the jungle, made it to a river, took a canoe up the river to a truck, which took me to a like airfield in a, as an airfield in like a, like a farm. I took off on the plane. They couldn't land because of weather. So we had to go over the mountain to the other side, landed, got an ambulance that had to go through the mountain pass at like 15, 16,000 feet. We passed out, me and the producer passed out in the, in the back of the thing from basically, you know, going hypoxic, which I started to realize because I was a jump dive guy. So I started to realize what was happening. And I just, I yelled out of them. They were, they didn't speak English. And I just did this and they started looking at me and they're like, oh, they started laughing. So they threw the oxygen back and we started puff, puff, passing the oxygen. Cause I was like, totally like arms were going numb. I'm like going out. I'm like the tunnel's coming in. And uh, finally we get there. I had emergency surgery in Bolivia as I, in this, like, it looked like a 1950s psych ward, no windows. What could go wrong? Digi, uh, yeah, it is a failed surgery. Dingy, dingy walls. The 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 IVs were bottles, glass bottles that they filled up, and they had the rubber tube. Yeah, like old school stuff. As I'm getting, nobody spoke English. As I'm getting wheeled to the the, the surgery room, there's a there's like a 1985 Playboy poster of a naked girl on the outside of the room, of the surgery center, <laughs> and I'm like. I'm looking at it going, well, I guess that's the, if that's the last thing I see, I mean, all right, this is it. This is the, out of all the stuff that I've done, this is, this is the way I've gone out, man. And then I woke up and, uh, they had, uh, it was just, a, I tried to escape. I was panicking. I, tr- I grabbed my passport and a credit card. I tried to escape this IV they had hooked up to me in the bottle was like, I couldn't reach to the ground. So I had to take the IV, I put it under my arm so I could get down and like get to my boots and like pick up all my stuff. And they had my bag right there. So I just dumped it out, grabbed, I was in like little short shorts, like silkies and a tank top, grabbed my passport. It's freezing. Bolivia sits at like 14,000 feet, if you guys didn't know. Um, And it's like, I think it was snowing and grabbed my passport and credit card. And I was like, if I can just get to the airport, I'll, I'll just buy whatever the hell flight I can do to get out of here. Cause nobody, I woke up out of surgery. Nobody was there. As I got there, I almost got in a fight with this. It was a private hospital. I almost got in a fight with a security guard. I'm like, listen, one hand or not, like I'm going to end your life, bro. If you get out of the way, the producer showed up, she was on the phone with my wife, it, like all got deescalated. My wife was there within like eight hours. They like, they got her there so fast they're like we can't handle this guy and uh anyways and then that was that and then they put me in a hotel this the tendon popped in the hotel audible pop then i had to come back have another surgery yeah that's the story yeah yikes brother <clears throat> just went from bad to worse <laughs> but hey here's the thing got healed from that sur- got healed from that surgery in four months Cracked my back on a horse ride as soon as I got healed from that. Two months later, I want to say, I summoned Mount Rainier with about six weeks of training. Nice. First time summoned on Mount Rainier. Six, six, exactly six months after the, the, the incident happened in Bolivia. Yeah. So say made, it can't be done, mofo. Say it can't back. be done. Yeah. <laughs> I love it, man. Also, yeah, yeah, great story. Thank you. All right, I think um, we have time for one final question from Dustin. Yeah. So ergonomics, it looks like you're at a standing desk. You're not at a traditional, you know, kind of way you're sitting when you're podcasting. Do you, um, I don't think I've seen that before. Do you feel like the way you think and the way you talk is different when you're standing versus, you know, people who are seated? It's really interesting. 
Yeah, I uh, I like to have like when I'm doing podcasts with you guys, I do my podcast from home. Um, so I like to stand up and be more animated. When I do my podcast in the studio, I, I sit, but my podcast in the studio are like three hours. So, yeah. And do you feel like there's an energy difference with the standing versus the sitting? Some, yeah, I do. I think it's calmer when you're sitting until somebody says something like they, they, they can trigger me in the studio and I can start banging on the table and get all elevated. And crazy. I'm sure you guys have seen that. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. I've gotten a little turned up. Yeah, which we appreciate. <laughs> Most definitely. But yeah, I, here I like, you know, we do so much. We do so much work at desk these days that it, like if you don't have a, a an up, whatever you call it, a up, down desk, like you're just you're just messing up. Plus your hips, man. We're not meant to be sitting in that position. Yeah. We're supposed to be sitting on the floor or standing or yeah, hunting like, tigers. I don't know. I mean, we called it like the third world position. But yeah, maybe that's maybe that's not okay. But like that's actually the natural resting position for human beings. But I know the work you're looking for. You're not people saying people can't yeah. do it. You know, you squat all the way down, deep squat, and kind of just rest yeah. there. Like you, you should be able to rest like that for a long time. But a long time, yeah, yeah, because the whole pretty much the whole world does it, except like Europe and America. <laughs> right. So, um, all right, hey, real quick, I wanted to uh, highlight your website so people know where to find you, and if you could give us a quick rundown of kind of the different things. Uh, Nick, that you and the rest of your team are doing between the coaching and then, you know, Johnny Slicks and, and the podcast, just give us a quick overview and that way. Uh, people yeah. So we it. work with, we work with men, the the first one being the ago, you work with men um, to really just, you know, they're men are, men are hurting, men are struggling. They got a lot of pain and they're in their own way. So we, with the Agogi, uh, we, we have a couple of different tiers. I do business coaching and individual coaching at a tier one level. And then the tier two is a one-on-one uh, coaching level with the coach and then you still get access to me through the mentorship uh and then the tier three level is the the solely like the group mentorship so twice a week we met, meet with everybody and deliver kind of some high level leadership from the stuff that we've talked about and uh and i hold them accountable and we you know we have challenges and we have different things that we do um but it really is like within a couple like i, I get message i just got a message from a wife this morning he's like man, he's been in the program for one week and I already have seen a change. Like, thank you for giving my, my, my husband back to me. Um, so that's, that's one. And, you know, we have a war against war against fat. So I'm getting all these guys like fit. Cause they, here's the deal. They got to lead. They got to lead. They have to set the example for their children and for their wives. When they change, when they become better, everything else gets better. They make more money. They have a better relationship. They have a better sex life. They have a, they, their kids start looking at them like a superhero instead of, you know, like, oh, that's that's just dad. And they look at him like I want literally have screenshots and messages of guys that their kids have said, when I grow up, I want to be like dad now. I want to have abs like dad. Like you're talking about a, a change. That's that's a change. And so that's that's what we do with the Agogi. And we operate off a four pillar system, which we talked a little bit about. Um, and then Johnny Slicks is, oh, man, this company. Uh, if you're, if you are a, uh, a man and you like to have fun time with your wife, you should be bathing in Johnny slicks and wearing Johnny slicks. And if you think that I'm joking, I'm not, and I will give you your money back. You buy it. I will give you your money back. If, if she doesn't cross paths with you in the hall and go, wow, what is happening? I promise <laughs> you, I have a hundred, I have a hundreds of thousands of we have, I think we're up to like 14 Johnny Slicks babies that literally have, women have gotten pregnant off of the smell of their man wearing, and you can, you know, figure out the rest of that story. That's the best sales pitch ever. <laughs> hey, and, here, and the reality is this, man, we, me and my, my business partner, he, he started making these products. He had three products, got out of the Marine Corps, was making them in his, making them in his, uh, in his kitchen. and he tried to get with me to like share them on YouTube or on the podcast or in something. And, and, um, and I smelt them. And I said, Oh my God, this is a million dollars. And I used them for about a week. And I said, this is a million dollar product. This is going to be a million dollar company. So him and I partnered, I asked him to to come up with $300 to start the business and he couldn't do it because he was, they were that broke. They were selling everything. We just talked about it on a podcast. They were selling everything. 
um, they were donating plasma and blood and anything they can do to raise money for this three hundred dollars. Couldn't make it happen. They got close, and I said, "That's ah, all right. Let's just do it." And uh, and then yeah, man, we became a seven figure company within I want to say three years. That's maybe impressive. two. I think I love the bomb. Made. Dust bomb made's awesome. Yep. Which one? Which one do you use? Omega or rugged? Omega. Omega. Yeah, you're over thirty. Everybody here is over thirty, so you guys would both be Omega or rugged. But that's it, man. That's what we do. Uh, and 100 percent American, uh, American made. We employ everybody here locally. We've moved. We've moved people here to work for us. Um, our team is constantly growing. We're constantly hiring people. Um, so we people have pushed us to try to outsource, and we just refuse. So we're 100 um, percent American made, American ran, uh, American sourced. That's how you make a difference, man. Freedom, yeah. And it's, it. uh, it's organic, too. Uh, well, you sold me at, uh, you know, the yeah. earlier sales. So I'm going to go buy all the products. I was going to ask for my short hair, though. I don't, have, I don't have the glorious beard yet. I got nine more years before I can retire. Yeah, we, we sell shave soap. Okay, there we go. All there right. you go. We, we got it for everybody, man. We got it for everybody. Good deal. Beard oil. I need some, need some beard oil. Yeah. All right. Well, I think that's a good place to wrap. Uh, it's nickkumalatsos.com. Also, he's on YouTube, Instagram, basically everywhere. Yep. Check out his podcast too, the Always Forward podcast. Uh, really good stuff. You talk a lot about a lot of different things that dads need to hear. I've personally benefited from it. So uh, shameless plug for your podcast there. It's awesome. And uh, Nick, appreciate your time. And if you have any final closing thoughts, feel free to share them right now. Otherwise, we'll wrap it up. Uh, it's just execute, man. Everything is in the execution. You can think and talk about everything, but if you're not doing, you're not doing anything. That's right. All right, man. Well, hey, really appreciate your time. Thanks uh, for your, all your wisdom and insight. And we're looking forward to taking what you've shared with us and our viewers take it and put it into action. So we'll catch you around. Take care. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of the Present Fathers Podcast. Make sure that you subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow us on Spotify to catch all of our amazing episodes. We will see you in the next one.